these days of Julius Caesar Mass need to dominate, all the shadows need to breathe Great to your pagan gods, while you twisting all them trees Scrape these, don't prove what you believe Your blind faith pass to your seeds Kill the guard inside weeds, turn around and blame it on me Why you blame me for blemishing a family tree I love you all of humanity Who you crazy? My God, the black God Who you crazy? My God, the brown God Who you crazy? My God, the white God Your reaction's kinda odd for a kid who does the lie Who you crazy? My God, the black God Who you crazy? My God, the brown God Who you crazy? My God, the white God Your reaction's kinda odd for a kid who does the lie Paul's letter to Romans opens by referring to Paul as a slave of Christ, whose news has been promised through the Holy Scripture. It is clear that this refers to the Messiahship of Jesus according to the prophets of the Jews. It goes on to say that Christ is Son of God by both being sprung from the line of David, but also by being miraculously appointed Son of God by Holy Spirit through resurrection. Firstly, we see that Christ was duly made Son of God, on the one end through his lineage and the other end through the appointment of the, quote, Spirit of Holiness, unquote. Whether this, quote, Spirit of Holiness, unquote, refers to God the Father or an intermediary between the human and the divine is unclear. But we see nonetheless a clear dialectic between flesh and spirit even in the first couple of verses. It strikes us as odd that there is no mention of Christ's incarnation as, quote, God in the flesh, unquote. But instead we see Christ made divine through several factors in being appointed. Here we see a quote, unquote, binitarian formula of two aspects of God instead of three. In Pauline cosmology, while God the Father reigns in heaven, the world is being prepared for the rule of God's only Son. Jesus is the Lord of mankind, as God rules in heaven. But now the world is prepared for the rule of Christ, who will reconcile the rule of heaven with the rule of earth. The formula is repeated in Romans 1-7, where Paul invoke, uh, um, invokes uh, God 
our Father, but also the Lord Jesus, as he says in Romans 1, 9. Quote, Your faith being known worldwide, since as God is my witness, whom I serve as the core of my being in service of the news of his Son. Unquote. We see here that while Jesus prescribes the method, he does so on God's authority. Paul declares his mission is unique and that he has been made in debt to barbarians and savages as well as the wise. Paul declares salvation to, quote, first, of course, the Jew and also to the Greek, unquote. This is where the confusion begins. If Paul's preaching is for the world, wise and savage alike, then why make this sort of distinction between Jew and Gentile? Furthermore, Paul is clear that the call of salvation to the non-Jew is made available through what has already been promised to the Jew. On the one hand, Paul gives preference to the Jew because he declares himself to be one and constantly references the promises that God made to the Jews. On the other end, he preaches to the Gentiles of a new covenant, superseding Jewish law. Still, Paul declares, um, citing scripture, Quote, the righteous man will live off faith, unquote. Describing his view of salvation by faith alone. Paul also, however, exhorts Christians to ponder and contemplate God's signs through the invisible attributes in the things he made. Romans one twenty. Paul also prescribes directives on those who are led astray by their own disobedience, turning to carnal pleasure. While these dictates towards contemplation and sexual purity are to be taken seriously by any uh, community wishing to gain some semblance of practice and a continuity of tradition, How do they match up with the life of faithfulness apart from works of the law? We assume Paul wishes to weed out hypocrites, as in Romans 2.3, where he warns hypocrites that God knows what they really do. The veracity of his preaching against hypocrites become apparent in his stance against the Torah. The only possible conclusion one could reach is that although Paul wishes to use the Torah as proof of his own teaching, he would not like his followers to rely on it exclusively or follow it. In Romans 2, 9 through 12... Paul explains that those who commit sin, whether Jew or Gentile, will be visited by tribulation, and no partiality is to be found with God. But he declares that Jew is first in incurring both God's wrath and glory. In Romans 2.12, he declares, quote, Everybody who sinned outside the reach of the Torah will also perish without reference to the Torah, unquote. But those who sin from the Torah will be held accountable by the Torah. Ultimately, we must ask, how how can um, 
Ask how no partiality can uh, uh, can be found, excuse me, in the fact that some are held accountable by the Torah and some not. Yet elsewhere, Paul declares that the Torah was given on behalf of transgressions. How can this be possible when Paul says in verse 214 in Romans that the Torah is toilet paper? He states, quote, For when Gentiles who do not have the law by nature do what the law requires, they are a law to themselves, unquote. Paul strikes down the law with three counts. One, the law holds accountable those who are under it. Two, the Torah can be given two ways. It can be passed by the flesh, by traditions, or it can be, quote, written on the heart, unquote. Three, one can arrive without the Torah and be a, quote, law unto themselves, unquote. To emphasize the point, the Torah, according to Paul, holds those accountable who read it and is valid, yet it cannot save you as it says it can. We must legitimately ask if the Torah is not the source or cause of one's salvation, then how can the words, quote, according to scripture, unquote, be conflated with this doctrine? Or do Paul's words against hypocrisy now seem a little piece of projection as he asks, quote, you then who teach others, do you not teach yourself? Unquote. Romans 2.21 Providing a fake solution is sometimes worse than not helping. Here Paul brings, uh, uh, brings in one of his main concepts that explores how he reconciles an apparently dual path of salvation. One can be circumcised in the flesh, but if you violate the Torah, still you are a revert despite your circumcision. Yet, one can have a, quote, circumcision of the heart, unquote. Which is the essence of the act of circumcision and not a physical trait or action taken on your part. Paul introduces this term in Romans 2.29. In the same verse, we read, A Jew is one inwardly. Quote unquote. And we know from earlier verses that invisible attributes and not the things seen up front are more important. The attributes of the invisible Jew are here described. The method of being a secret Jew or inward Jew are here prescribed. Paul describes the advantages of being a Jew who are vouchsafed revelation and says that God does not go back on his promises. Quote, Let God be true and every man be a liar. Unquote. Romans 3, 4. But Paul plays devil's advocate with the concept that God allows sin to prevail. We are not justified by deeds of the flesh. Romans 3.20 through 24. But by the blood of the covenant here shed by Christ of all mankind. 
Romans 3.35. Evil works cannot tarnish what is already forlorn, and no good can come by our own effort. This is why Paul states in Romans 3.8, quote, And why not do evil that good may come? As some people slanderously charge us with saying, their condemnation is just, unquote. We also remember that God is not only the God of the Jews, but also God of the Gentiles. Romans 3.29 This fact is made true by the fact of salvation by faith alone, which guarantees salvation to all mankind, and not by the law of the Torah, but by the view of faith and guidance through the supernatural. However, the question remains, is Paul upholding the law or putting the Torah on a new footing? Question. We must also ask if Gentiles are now held accountable by the Torah or the Jews free from it. It would seem for now the mystery only deepens, but we uncover more of Paul's stance in the next few chapters. God gave commands to Abraham and even tells him to circumcise himself and to take up the sword for God. Paul argues that since Abraham had not received the law of the Torah, he was not bound by it. But can this really mean that all God demanded of Abraham was faith? True, God relied on faith by reading the heart of Abraham. But was not this faith proved through some drastic means that consisted of complete self Sacrifice? Can we really allege that our great forefather in faith was saved by the merit of this faith alone? And not through his character that was like a firm rock on the shifting sands. Here, Paul makes his main point in Romans 4.15. Quote, For the law brings wrath, but where there is no law, there is no transgression. Where, Where is the law that just was written on the heart? Question. Are even these dismissed here? Question. Apparently, it doesn't matter if one reaches the Torah by what is written through the traditions or receives it by circumcision of the heart. But just having faith now is enough. What about reason being the bridge between faith and scripture as we are told by preachers and apologists? None of these views can abide Paul's teaching, as we will see. Since the law is given on behalf of transgression, there must have been no sin before law. But this is not technically true, according to Paul, because it is through Adam that sin first entered the world. Paul's Philosophy seems to treat the father of humanity with a unique disdain, blaming him for the sin of all mankind. Paul writes, quote, Just as sin came into the world through one man and death through sin, and so death spread to all men, unquote. Romans 5.12. But not to worry, because as he also writes, quote, 
God shows his love for us in that while we were sinners, Christ died for us. Since, therefore, we have now been justified by his blood, much more will be saved by him, unquote. Romans 5, 8 through 9. God sent his son as a second Adam, but we must ask, was not Adam also a son of God? Paul seems to support the notion of blood sacrifice quite readily. Of course, there are several issues left to explore. The first issue is while death is the penalty of sin, the death of Christ provides life everlasting. This means that everlasting life promise comes through the blood sacrifice and animal sacrifice performed by Jews at the temple, which Paul has already de um, delegitimized. Except, apparently, in this unique instance in which it was used to wipe away the sins of all humanity. The other issue is that Christ is a second Adam sent to correct the mistakes of the first. The notion of, quote, sins of the father, unquote, is a paradoxical concept in Christian teaching that blames Adam for the lowly status of mankind when it was our father, Adam, who through his prayers of forgiveness placed mankind on the lofty status that he now enjoys. In Paul, it is also God the Father who not only lets humanity suffer in sin by testing and cursing Adam. But humanity has to also wait for the entrance of the Lord into the historical scheme who by means of sacrificing his own son by blood sacrifice finally redeemed man and saves, quote, much more now that we are reconciled, unquote. Romans 5.10 But an obvious question must be asked about all, all these sons of Adam that came before. Were they cursed simply for being born? This brings us to the basic question in the problem of original sin that makes for paradoxical theodicy and an ominous soteriological scope. It may seem that God is directly responsible for sin and immorality. If that is not true, then we have to ask which fact is heavier on the scale of redemption and grace, that we are quite naturally sinful or that we are born in the image of God. The polarity between the two is mired in the confusing rhetoric of Paul who seeks to emphasize man's sinful nature to promote salvation by faith alone. Another puzzle is presented in the fact that our analysis of the New Testament shows us nowhere that Jesus makes the emphatic claim that he was sent to die for the sins of all mankind or that man is conceived in sin. This might mean that the human nature of Jesus also predisposed him to sin, as Paul reported earlier that Christ's lineage from the divinic line. Reported earlier about Christ's lineage from the Davidic line. Excuse me. A concept that creeps up in Paul is a sort of false humility. As Romans 5.3 says, quote, 
We rejoice in our suffering, knowing suffering produces endurance. Unquote. Wearing your suffering as a badge and a general sense of quietude in anticipation of salvation and grace is in one way the recounting of all your failures as successes, and it almost takes no effort to point out that this is also carried out by the wicked. On the one end, you are a humble servant bearing the burdens of others. On the other end, it is by these very means that you are made whole and boast on the account of accepting your station and calling. This is Paul's concept of being raised to be lowered. Hence, the suffering and the persecuted and meek are the children of God, but the joyful and liberated and sensual are chosen to fulfill that role. At least, to our mind, this constitutes a grotesque form of spiritual materialism and playing the role of victim constitutes a hallmark of liberal values. In Romans 5, 6-9, we see that the problem of sin is built right into the promise of redemption. In Romans 5.11, Paul says he rejoices in God through the Lord Jesus who was sent for our reconciliation. Jesus was sent by God as it plainly declares. So Jesus is not all powerful but under the decree of the Almighty God. We also clearly see the state of the law in Romans 5.20, where Paul declares, quote, The law came in to increase the trespass. Unquote. Essentially, as sin increased based on transgression of the law, so did the grace of God. In this clearly devised statement of rhetorical genius, the law is both a gift and a curse on the righteous. Although one who believes in Christ should not continue in sin, as Paul says, as the opening of Romans 6 such a disclaimer is necessary to clarify the previous statement, where the logical conclusion would seem to be that law plus sin equals grace. It is not the case that Christians, as clarified by Paul in Romans 6, 2-9, through 9, should actively sin but that having restored their belief in Christ, they are now no longer under the effect and persuasion of sin. Christians are dead to sin and have everlasting life, but those who still live in sin pay the penalty of sin, which is death. For Christians... Their old human nature is destroyed, so they are excluded from paying the penalty of sin. However, we must also remember that through suffering and endurance one reaches grace, and one can see that the path of reaching grace seemed to be treacherous one. But lo and behold, if we come to believe, we suffer no more on account of sin. Christians are, quote, no longer under law, but under grace. Unquote. Romans 6.14. So have no longer to do with sin. 
Paul claims that Christians are no longer at liberty to sin because they have been released by the law of the Torah in Romans 6.15. But can this really be true? Because as we just read, sin entered the world by one man and all are subject to it since birth. But those who come to believe are affecting continual grace and no longer subject to it. Question. This either means that Christians are no longer affected by their sinful nature or now free from it. In Romans 7, the mystery deepens when Paul declares that sin does not have agency but issues automatically without agency from the sinful nature of the sinner. This autonomic version of sin is more like blinking, breathing, masticating, and defecating. In Romans 7, nine, uh, 7 through 9, the argument and rhetorical tricks of Paul become extremely tightly wound and the complexity of several terms and relations in Paul's soteriological message is charted out. Anyone with a little time to investigate will find the arguments leveled, especially in Romans 9, to be debated and hotly contested by various Christian groups who have all arrived at different interpretations of these verses. Paul claims that the Torah, or law, governs man's conduct only as long as he is alive, but this obfuscates a final judgment into an eschatological redemptive state occurring neither in the balance of sin or in the penalty of sin whose wage is death. Paul declares in Romans 6.6, 6, quote, we know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing so that we no longer would be enslaved to sin. Unquote. And in Romans 7, 6, quote, We are released from the law having died to that which held us captive, unquote. Yet Paul does not say that law is sin, even though he says that the law was given on account of transgressions, but that sin caused the law itself to bear the wrath of God through its own covetousness, which makes it obsolete. Romans 7, 7 through 9. We take this to mean that those who followed the law with pridefulness caused it to become a tool to slander others, but the message is still unclear. Paul now platonizes sin and says that the law is holy and righteousness and righteous, excuse me, and good. The law is basically good, but has been hijacked by sin, which is practically synonymous with human nature. Paul's dialectic between law and sin is similar to the dialectic between flesh and spirit. Paul draws a dialectic also between the law of the inner being which is righteousness, and the law of the flesh, which is, quote, the old way of written code, unquote. Hence, there is external retribution for sin because 
the cause of sin is merely linked to the flesh and does not correspond to the inner being. For Paul still declares, quote, I delight in the law in my inner being, unquote. Romans 7, 22. This sin is manifest in the flesh and works of the flesh, and only purifies by the blood of Christ. Hence, no one who commits fleshly sin bears on the inner being, which is only manifested through the works of righteousness, through the Spirit. Paul makes it abundantly clear that even he cannot go beyond the sin of fleshly existence. But it is not him that is to blame, but rather the sinful nature in which he was conceived. Paul writes in Romans seven, fourteen through twenty one. Quote, For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am of the flesh, sold under sin, for I do not understand my own actions, for I do not do what I want but I do the very thing I hate. Now, if I do what I do not want, I agree with the law that it is good. So now it is no longer I who do it, but the sin that dwells within me. For I know that nothing good dwells in me. That is in my flesh. For I have the desire to do what is right, but not the ability to carry it out. For I do not do the good I want, but the evil I do not want is what I keep on doing. Now, if I do what I do not want... It is no longer I who do it, but the sin that dwells within me. So I find it to be a law that when I want to do right, evil lies close at hand. Unquote. Finally, Paul states, Wretched man that I am. Who will deliver me from this body of death? Romans 7.24 Proving that no one is good on their own accord, at least according to Paul. Paul states this in his usual self-deprecating manner. Since the formula for redemption precludes sin and suffering. The most miserable and most wretched are saved by the most grace. Because no one is outside the call for salvation of all mankind. But no one is saved on their own accord. We are all saved in spite of our own corrupt nature. No one is truly exempt. Paul exhorts us to walk not according to the flesh, but to the spirit. Romans 8.4 Paul introduces a new quote-unquote spiritual law and defines it in Romans 8. Paul says in Romans 8.12 that we are debtors, but not according to the flesh, and already dead, but those who live according to the Spirit, you put to death the deeds of the body, and so cannot experience the accidents of sin and flesh. The quote-unquote spirit of adoption, seen in Romans 8.15, 
is the one that prompts our own spirit so that we may become children of God. For we are co-beneficiaries of a new covenant not made in the flesh by dead words, but in the spirit through the suffering and glory shared with Christ. Romans 8.17 In Romans 8.18, Paul bids us to ignore our present suffering that we endure only for future glory. This establishes a unique role for the eschatological and teleological scope of Paul in his faith in the future. The present and past have no relevance for Paul, as the present is about quietude and suffering. This utilitarian sort of use of the notion of suffering for future reward is a cornerstone of the ethic that is built into Western thinking. As Paul states, quote, for the creation was subjected to, fu uh, uh, to futility. Subjected to futility. But because of, um, but because of him who subjected it in hope. Unquote. Romans 8.20. This establishes the twofold of Pauline thinking. A internal and the, uh, uh, um, an internal and external dualism of flesh and spirit. And a push and pull between present and future in a temporal dualism that battles between suffering and grace. We are quite sympathetic to the notion that those who are loved by um, God can be more than conquerors, but must point out that Paul derides the political power in the world in favor of a spiritual connection. Paul says he has transcended the power active in the world and states, quote, Neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor death, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God. In Romans 9, it is hard to tell if Paul is talking about the promise God made to Israel the Gentiles and nations being saved through the promise of Israel, a brand new path of salvation under a new covenant that invites Jews as well, or a dual path of salvation for Christians and Jews. Furthermore, we cannot suppose that Paul is speaking of a message according um, according to his own gospel, um, according to the old scriptures and traditions, or according to a prophecy foretold in the old scriptures that transcends the old covenant and transforms it into a message of salvation for all mankind. Lastly, we must ask who God saves at the end of the day. And does Paul actually see himself in a um, uh, uh, um, see himself as a convert to a new religion, or simply a fulfiller of old tradition? Paul laments, quote, "For I wish that I myself were accursed and cut off from Christ for the sake of my brothers, my kinsmen, according to the flesh." He reports that anguish um, in his heart and um, a, um, and implies um, that Israel is accursed. What he says next is that, quote, to them belong the adoption, the glory, the covenant, the giving of the law, the worship, and the promises, unquote. 
Romans 9, 3 through 4. Paul tells us, quote, It is not as though the word of God has failed, for not all who are descended from Israel belong to Israel. Unquote. Romans 9, 6. So in the first instance, Paul is cut off from his brothers in salvation for Christ. But it is through them that the promise was fulfilled, as it is through the patriarchs that Christ was brought forward, Romans 9.5. Ultimately, however, not all who call themselves Israel are Israel, as we just read. It is not hard to see how taken side by side these statements are rather confusing, and it may stand to reason that Paul is not making any consistent point on Judaism. He states, quote, It is not the children of the flesh who are the children of God, but the children of promise are counted as offspring, unquote. Romans 9, 8. This could only mean that one is no longer a Jew in the flesh, but only in the spiritual sense through adoption of God. In Romans 9, 16, we read, quote, It depends not on human will or exertion, but on God who has mercy, unquote. This reiterates the point that we are not saved because of our own effort or works. And on uh, who does the salvation rest? Paul tells us it is, quote, not from the Jews only, but also from the Gentiles. Unquote. In Romans 9, 24. But we must also remember that salvation comes to the Jew first, but eventually also to the Gentiles. Um, I'm sorry, Greeks, Gentiles, and pagans who are not part of the nation of God. Paul says Israel is blessed. But only some of Israel is truly blessed. He employs the verse, the elder shall serve the younger. In an eschatological scheme, which means that God chose Israel in order to give salvation to the world, almost reversing the original meaning of the verse. According to Paul, one is, ha- one is hated or blessed only by God's decree. These blessed and hated ones are chosen by God in advance, yet still put through trials. Then Paul cites Hosea in Romans 9.25 and claims that God changes who he hates and blesses. After all, this uh, we are somehow to believe that God's salvation is now open to all people. This is due to the staggering claim made by Paul that God brings in nations who are not Jews to serve the ones who he has once cursed. We fail to realize how such a decision to come to faith could ever be achieved given those various stipulations. St. Paul removes that option unless he means that God blesses those he once cursed by getting ahead of the sinner in a sort of guidance that is a synergistic union of human and divine. Ultimately, one cannot possibly believe that Jews were tested by God and cursed by God, but eventually blessed the whole world, even in their state of disobedience. Furthermore, in a paradoxical twist, this law has now been superseded and fulfilled and is both the source and the knowledge and proof of that which has superseded it. 
we see that Paul is the source of the view that Jesus is predicted in the Old Testament. Paul says that, quote, Christ is the end of the law, unquote, and the fulfillment of the law of the Torah, Romans 10.4. Paul now declares that there is no distinction between Jew and, and Greek in Romans 10.12. Finally, Paul derives Greeks in favor of Jewish salvation and says, quote, did Israel not understand? Question. Um, first, Moses says, I will make you jealous uh, um, of those who are not a nation with a foolish nation. I will make you angry, unquote. Romans 10, 19. On whose authority can Paul claim this? Well, Paul reassures us at the opening of Romans 11 that God has not rejected his chosen people and declares that he is from the tribe of Benjamin. God saves only a remnant, Romans 11.5. But here it is unclear if the remnant that is saved is part of the Jews while others are not saved. The Jews who come to believe in Christ or the Gentiles that have newly become grafted into the promise of salvation along with the Jews. In Romans eleven thirteen through 14, we read a strange admittance by Paul who says, quote, Inasmuch as I am the apostle to the Gentiles, I magnify my ministry in order to somehow make my fellow Jews jealous and thus save some of them, unquote. Again, it is unclear if Paul's ministry is on behalf of Jews or Gentiles. Then we read that while Gentiles are not part of the original message of salvation, they are, quote-unquote, grafted in. Romans eleven nineteen. Not only are Jews to be made Christians so they are saved, but Gentiles are grafted into the call of salvation predicted by the prophets of Israel. Thus Paul both has his proverbial cake and eats it too. It is no uh, feat for God to restore those once fallen, but in what covenant will the ones be grafted in if the old one is delegitimized? Question. The rhetoric becomes quite complex. In a quite dispensationalist passage, Paul declares, quote, a partial hardening has come upon Israel in part until the fullness of Gentiles has come in. Unquote. Here we see here we see a dual road of salvation. And one that has to wait for Israel. In a quite ambiguously phrased conclusion, Paul states, quote, as regards to the gospels, they are enemies for your sake, but as regards to the election, they are beloved for the sake of their forefathers. Um unquote, referring to the Jews in Romans 11.28. Paul says, how unsearchable are his judgments and, um, and inscrutable his ways, unquote. Romans 11.33, uh, yes, how unsearchable indeed. In addition to abandoning reason, Paul adds, quote, do not be conformed to this world, unquote. Romans 12, 2. Quite conversely, however, Paul also preaches a sort of quiet conformity and says, Bless your persecutors. Share the joy of the fortunate and the tears of the weepers. 
live in harmony and do not be haughty. Christians are not supposed to cause a stir. We certainly do not disagree with Paul's exhortations to feed the hungry, but find it contradicts his earlier command to, quote, rejoice with those who rejoice, unquote, and not challenge power or dwell on material good. Romans twelve fourteen through 20. Now, as um, uh, uh, I'm now at the beginning of Romans 13. Paul preaches extreme conformity and promulgates to his followers to, quote, let every person be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God, and those that exist have been instituted by God, unquote. Romans 13, 11. Not only does Paul teach humans are born into the curse of the law through the flesh and cannot affect their own salvation, Paul also states that no one try to change their own station in life or question those in power to affect change in the world. The only option one is left is to wait for future salvation that exists in the kingdom of God. Just like those works of the flesh, those powers of the world are used in a sort of cosmic utilitarianism for the world to come that prepares us for the kingdom of God. Whoever resists authorities resists who God appointed. But how does this square with, quote, blessed are the meek, unquote? Paul tells us to obey the authorities only insofar as we can escape their judgment, Romans 13.3. Paul also says the rulers do not, quote, bear the sword in vain, unquote. Romans uh, 13.4. Now we read, quote, whoever loves one another has fulfilled the law, unquote. But we must remind the reader that this is referring to the law of the Torah that Christ has freed us from already. Romans 13.10 The sword of the authorities is from God, but we should have no fear. Because love is the fulfillment of the law. To this end, we must don Christ like a quote-unquote second skin. And as an armor of light to wait to receive our new bodies in the world to come. Paul declares in Romans 14 that quote, the weak person eats only vegetables, unquote. But when nearly a fifth of the uh, of the earth is stables of pigs, chickens, and cows to make hamburger fillets for the mass of humanity that doesn't question what it takes to procure their food sources, we must relegate the statement to the realm of absurdity and give it no credence. Suffice it to say that Paul's diatribe on going beyond dietary restrictions is strange for several reasons. In Gentiles, uh, I mean uh, Genesis, excuse me, nine four, we read, quote, "But you shall not eat flesh with its life, that is, its blood." Unquote. But Paul also allows meat sacrificed to idols. Either way, all dictates in Paul are according to one's internal state and inner consciousness about how he chooses to follow the law and is not in the written law itself. To this end, Paul's teaching, uh, 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 Paul's teachings are highly individualistic. And he says, quote, it is good not to eat meat or drink wine or to do anything that causes your brother to stumble. The, the faith you keep between, um, is between yourself and God, unquote. 
Romans 14, 21 through 22. Paul finally smuggles in the Holy Spirit at the end of the letter to Romans 15, uh, 13 through 16. The Holy Spirit is connected with the hope of future salvation. And the, con- and the completion of God's plan in time, according to the historical events mentioned in the Bible, where his spirit acts through history itself. This is significant for the two poles of redemption in Rome and Jerusalem for Gentile and Jew. It is notable that Paul appears to have established the first church in Rome, that would later align with the Roman power, but also that Paul talks extensively about the promise God made to Israel and to the Jews that is used by Christian Zionists and Jewish Messianists to usher in a new age. Finally, Paul declares that we, sus- uh, um, what we suspected all along and saying, quote, And this I make my ambition to preach the gospel, not where Christ has already been named, lest I build on somebody else's foundation. Paul does not teach what has already been taught, where it was already said, and what has already been said, but brings a brand new message of salvation he also states quote this is the reason why i have so often been hindered from coming to you romans 16 contains notable mentions of figures associated with the pauline ministry What cannot be easily explained away is Paul's connections to elite Jews. This may help explain why the Pauline corpus had so much range. Because these backers with immense uh, resources, Paul greets Herodian as his kinsman in Romans 16.11. Here we see Paul greet the enemies of Christ and John the Baptist, who had John the Baptist killed. And attacked both Jesus and his family. Treated on equal terms and friendly terms by Paul. Thank you for joining us. On the molecular level, we are all the same. We are what you call entangled. I need clarity, and there's a thousand people after me My mind is bugging out, I gotta kill up all these bastards See, make sure that it is past to me I burn it cause it kill the stress Cause really what I live on a daily basis is just a mess I feel it, yes, but we the bless I need a couple weeks at best Proceed, I must indeed with we got speed to all the Buddha sets I'm just a baby new to this I know I'm getting through to this Or maybe getting through to who And really who the hell are you? But really who the hell am I? And really who the hell are we? And really what the hell is this, this ain't the place I wanna be I look down at my little seed and wipe the tears up off her cheeks I only get to see you once in a while every couple weeks I wander through these deadly streets with nothing in my brain but anger Work the baby mama, one of these days I'ma have to hang her No respect like Dangerfield, my neighborhood like Cloverfield I'm holding on to promises that already been unfulfilled Who am I, what are they, what are we supposed to be Slaves in this society or patrons of humanity More forgotten casualties were looked at as commodities could it be that possibly it's falsified philosophies? Who am I? What are they? What are we supposed to be? Slaves in this society or patrons of humanity? As I'm observing from the sky, I prepare my flesh for
I'm beasting it this year for real I dare you try to cross my path I'm leaving nothing in my wake Unless you're in my aftermath I never had a lot of cash And frankly I don't give a damn Forget about the dividend My favorite game was kick the can Was searching for a helping hand Was suffering with purpose Cause in turn it made me who I am There's people who observe us And they watching with binoculars Maneuver through metropolis They cry upon sarcophagus Is poisoning the populace It's almost die The clock is ticking in the sky It's I and I You're guaranteed a quicker death if you ingest in cyanide Now putting all that to the side I'm trying not to lose my focus I came to destroy, okay I'm deadly like a plague of locusts Jibber jabbing knives that poke us All we are is slabs of meat There's mothers with their children Homeless living in the dirty street I'm choking up, could barely speak I had a Machiavelli week And realized that we the wise But marketed like deli meat Who am I? What are they? What are we supposed to be? Slaves in this society Your patrons of humanity More forgotten casualties We looked at as commodities could it be that possibly it's falsified philosophies? Who am I? What are they? What are we supposed to be? Slaves in this society or patrons of humanity? As I'm observing from the sky, I am a flesh for atmosphere traveling passages through my mind's eyes. The future's full of enemies, its energy's consistency Was homeless at a point and had to live in an efficiency 26 emergency, I'm getting older urgency There's devils playing tricks on me, they poking me and burning me I might just lose it, then I think there has to be a better way The grass is always greener on the other side is what they say Tell me how you feel today, I'll tell you what I'm feeling rotten Looking for an opportunity to bug and get it popping Who am I? What are they? What are we supposed to be? Slaves in this society? Your patrons of humanity More forgotten casualties Were looked at as commodities Could it be that possibly It's falsified philosophies Who am I? What are they? What are we supposed to be? Slaves in this society Your patrons of humanity As I'm observing from the sky